Chapter 6 I'd probably only walked a couple of kilometers before I became too tired and sore to continue on any further. I tucked myself into a copse of trees far off the path and pulled the shawl tight around my shoulders to sleep. Using the package from inside my father's bag as a pillow, I doubted I'd get any real rest this way, but I didn't care if I did. If I slept too deeply, I'd have nightmares. I dug into my father's bag again and pulled out a blanket he sometimes used as a trick to make a person disappear in front of a crowd of onlookers. The blanket itself wasn't much for warmth, but it might offer me some bit of comfort tonight as I cuddled it to close to, cuddled it to my chest. My eyes became sleepy, and as I closed them, I wished my father could have the, had the kind of magic to disappear when the Cossacks had come for him. More than anything, I wished magic were real which made me hurt even more to know that it wasn't, that without him, it never could be real. I stayed curled up in that position, drifting in and out of an empty sleep that left me more tired than when I began. Thankfully, it was a warm night, but still I shivered through it out of fear and loneliness, I supposed. Finally, the sun began to rise, and with it, my mood began to improve. Maybe the worst was over. Maybe the soldiers would realize it had been all been a mistake, and my parents would be released wherever they were. I sat up, stuffed the blanket back into the shoulder bag, and ate one of the cakes, saving the rest for later, for I had no idea how long it would take to walk the rest of the way to Venska. I grabbed a nearby stick and pressed it against the side of my ankle, and then used Violetta's shawl to tie it tight to my leg. I hoped that would brace it and lessen the pain of walking. So far this morning... I'd done well for myself. That was until I picked up the package. The forest floor must have been a bit damp for the cloth around the package had soaked up some moisture overnight. If the moisture had gotten to whatever was inside, I didn't care. My mother had been right in all her pleas and protests to my father that it would end badly. I cared nothing for whatever was in that package, except that my father had cared deeply about it, and my mother had too, despite her worries. They had sacrificed their freedom for it and may yet lose their lives for it. What could possibly be so valuable? Then something exciting occurred to me. A thought that lifted my spirits again. If this package was so valuable, then surely it could be useful in getting my parents back. I had something the Cossacks clearly wanted, and they had my parents. Maybe we could make a trade. My heart pounded with anticipation, with hope. But then... It almost immediately sank into nothingness. I couldn't make a trade with the Cossacks. I didn't know any of them personally and certainly couldn't trust them. If I presented them with the package, they wouldn't agree to a trade. They'd merely arrest me and take the package for themselves. Maybe Milda could make the trade. Maybe that's why my mother wanted the, this package to go to her, because she would be able to use it to get them back. My eyes fell upon the wrapping again. I had promised to get it to Milda but had never promised it would arrive unopened. I sat the package, set the package on my lap and tugged at the knot. But somewhere behind me, a branch cracked. Maybe it was only an animal or a whisper of, in the, of the morning breeze. But maybe not. I grabbed the basket of cake, cakes, checked quickly to be sure I'd left nothing behind, and then ran as fast as my ankle would allow. My entire foot throbbed worse than it had last night. I didn't think it was broken or else I couldn't have walked on it at all. But I was sure whatever damage I'd done to it was made worse by so much walking, which meant by the time I get to, got to Venska, I'd be lucky if I wasn't dragging myself to Milda's front door. Along the way, I passed a small river straddled by a bridge as wide as only three planks of wood and suspended by weathered rope. I hoped it was safe because I needed to cross it. So I held my breath, held even tighter to the rope, and took my first step forward. When I'd crossed, I looked back and felt a swell of pride. There, that hadn't been nearly so difficult as I'd expected. I paused at the river's edge for a long drink, where the water had pooled and become still. I stared at myself in the reflection and gasped. I looked horrible. Streaks of dirt lined my cheeks where I'd brushed tears off my face. Both my braids looked like something had clawed bits of hair loose to stick out in all directions, and my eyes were still red, though there was nothing I could do about that. I washed my face, which already helped me feel a bit better, then undid my braids, finger combed my hair the best I could, and then braided it again as neatly as possible. While I rested, I ate the second of the three cakes in the basket. I knew I shouldn't have. It surely 
it would surely take at least the rest of the day to walk to Venska, and I was bound to get hungry. But I was hungry now, too. Once I'd finished the cake, I decided I had better keep walking and get as far along the path as possible before my stomach rumbled for more food. By mid-morning, I reached the fork in the path that Philip had told me about, or at least it seemed like a fork. I didn't think the trail that led to the night right had gotten much use, but maybe a few people ever went to Venska. Maybe just me and an occasional squirrel. However, it became clear within the hour that I had taken a wrong turn. The worn path beneath my feet had faded into young summer plants and old autumn leaves, so thick I knew nothing else had passed this way. Not even a squirrel. At least there was no evidence of soldiers passing this way either, so if I was lost, it could be worse. But I was lost, and I'd been lost for long enough that I wasn't even sure how to retrace my steps back to where I thought there had been a fork in the trail. I would have to hope that if I continued, I would eventually come to Milda's village, or to any village where I might receive some help. I limped forward while the sun rose in the sky and continued on even as it began to sink again. With it, my, period, my spirit sank too. For all I knew, I'd passed Venska hours ago and was halfway to Russia by now. My mood worsened further when I first heard the sound of a river. Philip had said nothing about having to cross a second river, so I knew now that I was very far from where I ought to be. I rounded a bend and came upon it and then sighed. This river was much too wide to jump across, and if I tried to wade through it, I'd be soaked for the rest of the day and probably into the evening. I searched upstream and I, until I found an area with enough rocks that I could step from one to the other to cross, and it worked perfectly at first. Halfway across, my injured foot teetered on an uneven rock. One arm held on to the package while the other arm flapped wildly in the air, trying to keep my balance. For the first time, I was glad to be alone because I must have looked ridiculous. Nor did it work. I fell bottom first into the water, landing on a sandbar half meter deep. Instinctively, I'd held up my father's bag so it was only splashed, but it cost me the last cake to protect it. That had fallen from the basket in my arms and was now sailing down the river, sinking slower, lower until it was out of sight. Tears filled my eyes, but I fought them back. It was absurd to cry for the loss of a cake when I'd lost my parents less than a day ago, and their loss was far worse. Maybe these tears weren't for the cake at all. Why didn't you cross... Why did you cross, excuse me, why didn't you cross on that log? The words were in Lithuanian, not Russian, but I still froze in place. I turned to see a boy down river standing beside a donkey, allowing it to drink from the water. Between us was a saved log nearly flat for crossing the river. How I had missed that. Worse still, how had I missed this boy? He looked older than me for a year or two, but was about my height. So either I was a little tall for my age, or he was a little short. I wasn't sure. His brown hair was tousled and in need of a cut, but I gathered from the unkept look of his clothes that his appearance wasn't a priority. He had a nice smile, though, or he would have if his smile wasn't so upsetting. Was he laughing at me? I prefer crossing on rocks, I told him, which was a stupid thing to say. Ah, round river rocks with slippery moss in the sides, he grinned. So he was laughing at me. Excellent choice. I stood, but my ankle hurt worse than ever, and with the current pulling at my legs, legs I began hobble, wobbling. The boy left the donkey and ran for me, catching me beneath the arms just as I was about to splash in again. It's no crime to ask for help, he said, putting an arm around my shoulder, and then he smiled again. Unless you ask in Lithuania, of course. Then it's a very serious crime. I tilted my head as I looked over at him. What a strange boy he was. He nodded at the package in my arms. May I carry that for you? No, I pulled it to my chest. I wouldn't hand it over to anyone other than Milda, or maybe the Cossacks, if Milda wouldn't help me bargain with them for my parents. He shrugged and led me the rest of the way to the river, and then let me sit on the grasses to rest. I'm Lucas, he said. I haven't seen you around here before. He hesitated, waiting for me to say something, and when I didn't, he added, Are you lost? I'm trying to get to Venska, I said. Lucas grinned again. Then you are indeed lost, he pointed behind me. Venska is about a half kilometer behind us now. Once you get out of these woods, be careful to spot the path leading into the village. It's easy to miss. I grimaced and got to my feet again. I'd only taken a few steps before I braced myself for greater courage and then said, 
Can you show me the way? Lucas hesitated and looked around him. No, I'm sorry, I can't. Please? He shrugged. I am not someone you want as a friend, trust me. I didn't need a friend. I only knew that I was hungry and tired and my emotions were wrung out. I couldn't risk missing the turn and end up walking straight back into Rosikoff and his men. It wasn't in me to ask for help or really to ask for anything at all, but I had to convince this boy to help me. I considered offering him some sort of bribe or payment, but I w- when I looked in my father's bag, hoping a few coins might have magically appeared, I saw nothing except for magic. Papa had let me practice with his tricks all I wanted, though I'd never tried the tricks on anyone but him and Mama. Did I dare to test a trick on Lucas? No, but I also didn't dare to return to the woods without him as a guide. That would be far worse. I reached into my father's bag and pulled out a deck of cards. What if we make a bargain? You can pick any card from this deck, and if I guess what it is, you have to take me to Venska. Lucas grinned. And if you don't guess it, I'll show you what's in the package. He cocked his head. You'll give me what's in the package, you mean. I nodded, trying to look as if this was a fair game, when it wasn't. Any card I choose, Lucas asked. Technically, it'd be the exact card I wanted him to choose, but this was a trick my father had taught me years ago. I could do it in my sleep, and as I tired, and as tired as I was, I might almost be doing that very thing. I fanned out the cards face down so that neither of us could see them. Lucas pulled a card from the deck. Look at it, I instructed him, then return it to the pile. He did, and then I shuffled the cards back together. He watched me carefully, thinking he had gotten the better of me. I held up one random card for him, a jack of spades. It is, it isn't this one, and held up a second, a red seven. Not this one. Lucas smiled. Are you going to tell me all the cards it's not, or one it is? Because our bet, I held up a third card, the ten of clubs. It was this one. Lucas's smile turned to amazement, and when he recovered, he bowed low. I don't know how you did that, but you win. Where in Venska would you like to go? I opened my mouth, but realized I'd forgotten the full name of the woman I was supposed to find. Or I'm looking for Milda. Sabian, Lucas grinned. You know her. I do. She always has a treat for Pasha when we come. I couldn't help but smile. Pasha. In Russian, it meant small and humble. Lucas nodded toward the donkey and then added, The name is to remind this animal who is in charge. He tugged at Pasha's rope, again, but to no avail. It's obviously not me. My father is away on business. I suppose he won't know that I'm not going to be home tonight again. He cocked his head to, at me to follow him. Let's go. I began following him, following him away and then asked, What do you mean, again? Lucas chuckled to himself. You've heard the story of the fool son. Yes. I shrugged. No. Ah, well, the name tells you all you need to know. My father considers me a great fool, and he may be right. I don't need to go home to be reminded of that every time he speaks to me. I'd give anything to go home, I whispered, too low for him to hear, which was a good thing, because I could never explain to him that I understood exactly what he'd meant. I would not be going home tonight either. I would likely never be going home again.